Hey there, Acers. Let's see if I can get this adjusted a little bit better. So hi, it's Saturday afternoon and I'm just glad to be here, glad to be with you again. And welcome to the next episode of Ace Roleplaying Games. I, first of all, want to thank those of you who have gone back and watched my older videos and who are joining me for your first time even. Uh, of course, Ace Roleplaying Games, Ace stands for Achieve, Create, and Entertain. And we are a club that specializes in playing role-playing games, specifically at the present with teens, to give you guys who are teens a chance to grow and become something a little bit more than what the world has planned for you. This is giving you a chance to be in charge of your own world. And for just a bit, you get to be more powerful than what the world would let you be. So that's one of the cool things about role-playing games in general. I really like the fact that role-playing games give me that chance to be something or someone I could never be. And that kind of leads to a question. How do we represent these people that we could never really be? You know, we're, we're, we're pretending. It's a grown-up game of make-believe. And that's okay. We don't have to be little kids going around the, the schoolyard going, bang, bang, I got you. Bang, bang, bang. And then the other person saying, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't get me. You missed me. Ha, ha, ha. No. Role-playing games give us that opportunity to use, um, for us to use not only our imaginations, but also our to, to use rules to represent success and failure in that world. Because, hey, let's face it, first and foremost, failure is actually more interesting than success. And this is the reason why. Because when you have failure, when you fail, you are finding yourself in a position where you realize that what you were trying to do or what you did was not successful. So you learn, and that's what—that's one of the things that we're not taught in schools anymore today. I, I, yeah, I, I fall into that category of the old guy saying, "Back in my day, where's my soap?" But it's true. When I was a kid, you failed, and you got you got stuck with the results, and then you learned how not to do it and how to move on. So, that's what role-playing games give you a chance to do as well, is to fail. And to fail in such a way that it's not going to actually hurt you. Because if I were a crack SEAL Team Commando, or, or any of the other special forces, um, Rangers, Green Berets, Combat Controllers, um, paramedic, um, or, um, paramedics, um, the pararescuers, there we are, um, or the, the SEALs, or, or the Force Recons, or any of those groups, if I was one of those guys, and my gun jammed, I would have actual training on how to unjam it, but, we, as role players, have never been in a combat zone, or most of us haven't, have never been in a combat zone where we had our gun jam and we had to do something about it. Because this isn't a simulationist thing. We're not recreating anything. We're not like those cool people down at Evermore. We're not sitting there and going, hey, let's dress up in orc costumes and prance around. We are playing a game. We are rolling dice as the agreed upon arbitrator of our of our game. 
So we have rules to represent those parts of the story because ultimately we are still playing a story. And it becomes a story as we play it. As a game master, you are not responsible for the story itself. You're responsible for the plot of what could be happening, but if the players decide not to engage with it, players decide not to engage with it, and they're going to go off and do their thing. So, you are, if they decide absolutely, 100%, they will not engage with it. You're welcome to say, you know what? I'm glad that you guys want to go do that thing tonight. I don't feel like running that thing. So why don't you guys go do it, and you can come back to me and tell me how it goes. Tell me when you want to run this game, or if, you, if there's another game that I like that you want to run. Because you, as a game master, are a player at the table. You get to have a say in it. So that brings me to that actually having a say in it and everything like that. That brings me to safety and rules at a table. So, cherry pit bag. Anyway, so here's how we at Ace Role Playing Games do the rules. We are trying to cause the least harm and discomfort to anyone possible, but that means on all sides of any argument. So, one of our first rules is keep your hands to yourself. Don't touch other people, don't touch their things, unless they invite you to or unless you have asked. That's one of our big rules. Another big rule is Grown-up topics and concerns need to stay at the door. You can discuss them with your parents or your guardians, but please do not bring grown-up topics or concern to an ace role-playing game table. We love having you there, but we come to play a game, to tell a story, not to try and bring real-world concerns, things that make one side or another side of any group feel bothered and angry and upset. And we just ban them. I mean, because there are things, like to use a good example, I, I, my degree is in English. I love reading books. And that's something that if you're a game master, pick up books, read books. Read stories where the plot says that the character has to be that cool. Like Lord of the Rings. Or Doom. Plot says those ha things have to be cool, so they, they are that cool, and they happen that way because they're that cool. Because the plot says so. So, as an example, though, I, um, in my English degree, had to learn about postmodernist theory. And now I know, so maybe some of you guys out there are starting to go, la, 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 because you don't want to hear it. But the basic idea is that only your experiences can define what is real. And you get to use language to decide if it's real or not. And, I mean, there's the classic, I think, René Magritte? I think that's the name of the, the French painter. Anyway, there's a picture of a pipe in a frame, and it says, this is not a pipe. It says, this is not a pipe. And that is pretty cool. I, I like the, the head trippy aspect of it. And, you know, if you really want to get zoned out, woo, if you really want to get zoned out, just go watch Terry Gilliam's Brazil, but not until you're older. Because mom and dad might not like that. It is definitely rated R. So careful with that one. And as, as the creator and, and head of Ace Role Playing Games as a corporation side of things, the, the, the non-profit side of it that's helping to support the establishment of clubs, I am telling you right now, <clears throat> I will not encourage you to listen to things, watch things, or even play things that would make your parents uncomfortable. <clears throat> because their buy-in to this whole role playing game thing happens to be key to getting it to work. Because who knows, one of them may be your sponsor. 
Anyway, so with postmodernism, it says that that I can't know anything without knowing things. And um, postmodernists even argue as to whether or not the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That is a, that is a scientifically truly proven fact because it's actually obviously the rotation of the earth and the way that the sun shines on portions of the earth as it rotates around inside the, the rays of its light. And postmodernists might argue that well, the sun really might not be the sun. It might be something else. I might choose to call it a laughing hyena or something like that. Those kind of things bog down the table. They make it no fun for anybody. I mean, you probably just got bored listening to me talk about it. I was bored and I was talking about it. So let's keep the grown-up topics and ideas and philosophies at the door. When we come into Ace Role-Playing Games, we are here to play. And as a game master for Ace Role-Playing Games, your job is to keep the table fun. That's it. I want you to be paying attention to the fun at the table. And if the players aren't having fun, if you're not having fun, then it's time to take a break and figure out what would be fun. Sometimes it might mean not even role-playing at all. Sometimes it means just breaking out a board game and playing Betrayal at House on the Hill or Mansions of Madness or something like that. And so that is why, and, and safety in role-playing games is a big buzzword right now. And by safety, I don't mean that you are so focused on those grown-up issues that you don't that you self-censor and you don't play your character the way you would like to play them if you're a player or that you don't play the villains the way you'd like to play them if you're the game master i want you to use your brains and pick something that okay as an example of a safety thing let's say violence against children in the role-playing game. I personally do not like to have that on camera. If you have a villain who's gone through and killed the whole town, men, women, and children, that's what you say, but you don't have to show the bodies of the children. You can let the player's imaginations fill in the bodies of the children. If spiders are something that really there's somebody at the table who the player themselves has a phobia of spiders, Maybe it's a good idea to just say, you know what? In this game, we're not going to do spiders. And the way you find out these sensitive topic scenarios, because they're, they're really, I mean, me, I was pretty crappy at heights. However, my really cool urban ranger is not crappy at heights. He's actually pretty cool. Climbing up walls and shooting arrows from a distance. So, since since he's good at it, and I'm not, I let the rules fill in for me. I, I make a an athletics roll or an acrobatics roll or whatever game I'm playing. I make a roll on dice and let the dice determine if I'm successful or not in climbing that wall. That is that is really how it should go. So Another rule is that we're, we are here to have fun. Everybody at the table should be looking out for everybody else's fun. Maybe you as a game master might not notice that somebody was made uncomfortable because you were talking about giant spiders. Let's just stick with that. But one of the players knows that the girl sitting next to her is horrified of spiders. Even the thought of spiders just makes her freeze up. But she's trying to keep the fun table so much that she's not telling you. So we go ahead and the friend can come to the game master and say, hey, let's not do spiders anymore. I mean, there, there is the idea of what's called an X card. And that is, if you're playing more traditional at, at a table, you reach out and you touch an X when something in the current scene makes people uncomfortable. 
And that's an okay thing to do because the safety of the gamers is on your shoulders as a game master. So that might mean, in order to preserve the fun and keep them safe, that you have to ask players to leave the group. And, and as the game master, you have, if, if there's more than one game master, congratulations. But as a game master in an ace role-playing game club, club um, you are responsible for making sure that the table is not a place of discomfort and animosity to the greatest extent that you can. Now, if somebody there wants to break the rules and talk about issues that come up that might be considered taboo that teenagers really shouldn't be worried about, then that's where you remind everybody of the rule first. And every ace role player should have access to the rules. We're working on putting them up on our first Discord site right now, our Discord server right now. And hopefully we can get all of you other acers out there to join on this Discord server so we can become a big organic community. They can share ideas and we can have little competitions. Maybe maybe one summer we'll, we'll actually have a competition and we'll write uh, an adventure. I'm going through an experience like that right now myself, writing my adventure. And it's, it's a lot of fun and a lot of work, but it's, it's a lot of fun to do. The only downside, like I said before, is trying to move around that. And hey, moving happens. Life happens. And like I've said before, art and fun serve life. Not the other way around. So those are just my, my thoughts on those and everything. And... Um, I want to go ahead and talk this last few minutes about a game or setting that really made some sort of an emotional impact on me. So my first role-playing game was Rifts. And <clears throat> I like the setting. It's really cool to think of this world where these rifts in space and time and reality open up and a character from anywhere and any time and any place can be sucked in. Palladium Books put it out, and their version in 1991 when I bought it sucked. And here's why. Because I was a relatively poor high school student, <clears throat> or junior high school student, and I had saved up my money, a ton of money for me at the time. I'd saved up my money, and I went down to, I think it was, I had to go to Dragon's Key, Provo, which for me was a, it was a bus ride of almost two hours to get down there. I got to the store, I bought Riffs, and I had to take the bus back home to Lehigh. Lehigh service for the bus was not good. And yes, it was uphill both ways. And they had to plow through six feet of snow with me on the bus. And so, anyway, I got it home and I started reading the book and it was great and it had this section on character creation and I wanted to make one of these electric knights that were basically Jedi or uh, whatever they were. And they, they were these really cool knights and they were glitter boys with their power armor and just all the, you know, and these juicers that were basically drugged out psychos that wouldn't last the whole game because they were going to die anyway. And it was a cool game, a cool setting. Well, imagine my consternation that when I get to the end of the book, looking in the back for the character sheet, or somewhere in the book for the character sheet, nothing, not a single page that looked like a character sheet. So I kind of kept my eye on the literature and kept my eye... I, I can't remember how I got informed of it, but I got informed that there was the Rift source book. And so I had to save up another $20 to go back down to the Dragon's Keep in Provo and get the source book. And that source book, like I said, so I mean, the, the core book was like 30 bucks, and the source book was another 20 bucks. So that's 50 bucks I was out to finally get the character sheet that was at the back of the source book. I don't even think I read the source book. I was just glad to have the character sheet. Then I had to get access to a copy machine, and for a while we were just writing things down. Because... Um, I think it was during that time I, I knew about, char uh, char uh, about uh, role-playing game books 
and source books because um, my friend Bjorn and I had been playing around with champions. And I'll save champions for another video because champions was... Champions is something that I remember quite fondly, but at the same time, I gotta... I... I... I gotta just save one of these spaces because I'm trying to keep these videos right around 20 minutes. And I'm just you know, getting to the end of that time frame. But the Rift's story ends with me being so fed up with the fact that it was complex. It, it was re very well written word-wise, but it wasn't well put together accessibility-wise. And I couldn't get anybody who really wanted to play it with me. And so I ended up selling my Rift's books when I was in high school to a German exchange student. I can't even remember his name now, but um, if you're my German exchange student guy that bought my Rift's books, hi. <laughs> um, I wish I could remember your name, but there's a bit there that I just don't quite remember. So best of luck to you on that. Um, but anyway, so that's Rift's. I, but the cool thing is the Savage Worlds actually partnered with Palladium Books and made riffs. And somebody took um, Robotech from Palladium Books and made uh, and from Palladium and made a Savage Worlds adaptation of Robotech. So the Palladium stuff, the stories that they had were not crappy. Kevin Symbiata and his group did a great job at bringing these games to at least a somewhat playable status. But I'm really glad that they partnered with with Pinnacle and made the Savage Worlds Rifts adaptation. And it's still selling like gangbusters. It's still one of the best settings out there. And you can bring characters in from any other setting. Uh, my, my friend Tracy actually brought a pirate character in from 50 Fathoms. And while that didn't quite work for her, it still was an example of what you could do. And that's really where I have to say... On the whole, this is a, again, I come back to Savage Worlds, for me, is the perfect system. Now, a buddy of mine and I are actually having this discussion about how to make superheroes that are definitely scaled. And for that, I might need to talk to, I might need to talk to um, Clint Black, eventually, about that and see what he has to say. But shout out to Clint and Jody and Shane all my folks at Pinnacle, Jessica, I just, I really love you guys and I hope to work more with you in the future. So anyway, Acers, keep rolling the dice, keep staying safe. Remember, we're gaming for good. And until tomorrow or the next video, whichever happens first, this is Mason Emerson saying, have a good one.